Welcome to Coffee House. So this past weekend, long weekend, I was invited by a friend to hang out at her pool. Very nice pool. And I have never been good at diving. That's something that I've, I've just never been able to do. I've been trying to push myself to be better at everything, and especially anything that I've been generally disinclined to do historically, I've been trying to do. So there are no pockets of hesitancy anywhere in my repertoire. But so I decided I was going to do this. I got two dives in that were pretty good. I wanted to really go for it on dive number three. I got up pretty high, came straight down, no splash, perfect. They're putting up the tens. Even the hostile countries were putting up tens. And I bashed my nose, my face, flat into the bottom of the pool. It was thoroughly painful. There's blood immediately. I have a huge chunk taken out of the top of it. And the whole thing, top to bottom, is bloodied and scabbing over. So there's the lesson, kids. (laughs) Don't try things that you're bad at to get better at them. Or in the alternative, just be careful when you're doing that. And don't dive at however many miles per hour I was going at the bottom of a pool. So anyway, my left ear is also completely blocked. I can't hear anything out of it. So uh, I am just an utter mess going into this episode, which is the discussion of War on the West by Douglas Murray. Now, as you can tell by the actual book episode, I think we enjoyed this pretty significantly as it fit a niche that we don't really have right now in kind of the resistance mindset, because we don't have a lot of people who are just defending the West and what comes out of the West and what the West stands for. So, what I wanted to discuss related to that was something that's uh, very large and very important, but not something that obviously you can do justice to in about 30 minutes or 15 minutes or however long this is going to end up being. But it does allow me to invoke my favorite subject in the whole wide world, Friedrich Nietzsche. So, he has this philosophy, this idea of the transvaluation of values. I like talking about grilling steak, too. That's pretty high up there. Anyway, so uh, the transvaluation of values, that is something that comes out of the Antichrist, one of Friedrich Nietzsche's books, where he talks about the fact that Christianity is not merely a religion, but also the predominant moral system of the Western world, and its system inverts nature and is generally hostile to life. That Christianity is a religion of pity. It elevates the weak over the strong, exalting that which is ill-constituted and weak. Christianity is derisive of natural values. Things like sex is considered sinful, strength is considered bad, and it exalts death over life in the resurrection and the afterlife. Now, of course, uh, advocates of Christianity, Christians in general, would say that, no, it's not a matter of a pure inversion or getting rid of those things entirely. It's a matter of those things in moderation. But Nietzsche is on to something very interesting here when he talks about the transvaluation of values, because this is something that happened about 2,000 years ago, is that you have all the things that are considered to be sources of strength or the good things, the moral things and ethical things that you're supposed to be pursuing, those are now considered something bad. And we have something similar going on right now, but I'll get to that. So why was Christianity successful, notwithstanding what it seems to be doing here, which is exalting weakness over strength? Why was it nonetheless successful, especially in places like the United States, in creating the most productive society in history? And I think there were a couple of tempering factors that were related to Christianity, specifically Christianity, in that era. So things like the Protestant work ethic, this idea that everyone has a vocation, that there's a nobility in work from the clergyman all the way down to the lowly laborer. And this is buttressed kind of by the fact that Christ himself was a woodworker. Uh, This was first popularized by Max Weber uh, in the Protestant ethic and the spirit of capitalism. So the idea is that there are a lot of things specific to Christianity and Protestantism and Uh, some aspects of Calvinism, like asceticism and predestination, that specifically was a buttress to the idea of capitalism, to the idea of work and productivity. So a lot of people challenge that conclusion by Weber and say that it actually comes from pre-Reformation Catholicism in those communities that had a lot of those things. But obviously this is a big, complex question. But the point is there are some things that are tempering certain inclinations of Christianity to exalt weakness over strength. So the American dream also, the, you know, the idea of manifest destiny and what it meant to have the American dream, how it was about having a family and being productive for your family and working as a unit, all those sorts of things, and pursuing the ends of the continent, all those things also contributed to being able to temper the transvaluation of values that Christianity was trying to accomplish at the time. 
So now we have this new transvaluation of values, and it could be like only the second time in history that this really happened in such a stark way. But the idea now with modern progressivism is that weakness is strength. So victimhood is exalted. It encourages people to be more victims, to gather more victim points. The idea of equity, just period, specifically reduces everyone to the weakest members of the polity. So whoever the weakest is, no other person can be exalted above the weakest person. So it reduces everybody to the weakest state. And this is uh, enshrined in, in things like schools who, like, there's a recent one who said they would eliminate testing because the test results were unfair to people of particular groups. And some schools said they were going to eliminate grades, you know, already I know just when I was plugged into it to some degree, they had eliminated the F grade and they were just going to ease and they stopped failing kids in some places, all that sort of thing. But even uh, specifically with the trans idea, there's something very complex going on here that I don't think people realize as much as they should. So in the greatest evolutionary likelihood, trans identity or gender confusion in general, it has less value biologically. So if you have something that is dimorphic, that has two sexes, uh, they have particular roles that have been affected over the course of millions of years and generations, then when you have a member of those groups, of that species, that is less clear, has more confusion related to that, of what their role is supposed to be, it's less biologically valuable in the state of nature. So it makes sense that dysphoria and suicidality would be attendant to its emergence. So people who have this kind of confusion, a mechanism for evolution to kind of clear those out would be to increase the likelihood of dysphoria and suicidality. So just leaving the evolutionary question aside, which is actually a really interesting one, is realize how little is actually accomplished by the idea of people who are trans. So it's practically the least accomplishment for the most effort that you can imagine. What does it actually accomplish? Is it gathering food more effectively? Is it defending the tribe in some substantial way? Is it contributing to reproduction? The things that we do to support the trans ideology don't actually accomplish anything, any concrete thing in the real world. So the point is that this is the new progressive ideas and ideology is a religious movement. Now, this has been said before, but I think there are some aspects of it and artifacts within it that are much clearer than people may have realized. So that's why it's uncompromising. That's why we don't have a middle ground somewhere between their precepts, the moral precepts that they establish, and somewhere in the middle, you know, some reasonable place that people can come to agree. That's why they don't allow for that is because it's a religious precept. And one of the the ideas to keep in mind is when it comes to things like cults, one of the aspects of cults that you'll see again and again is that they must make sure that their members have skin in the game. Whether that's money or contributing time or something like that or something more serious, the cults, to be effective, they must demand skin in the game. So it's the same thing when it comes to trans ideology, is that they have their proselytization, you know, just like any other religion, but they they also demand a penance, uh, some kind of payment. So these things are things like puberty blockers and surgery, and restating, obviously, particular catechisms about what trans ideology means. And the whole point is, they don't care if it's true. The point is not whether it's true or not. There are two different ways that conversations go. There are the ways where people talk to each other, and there are pieces taken from here, pieces taken from there, and they go, you know, a little to one direction, a little to the other direction, but they find some kind of a dialectic in it and some kind of a new result of their conversation. There are other conversations that just demand conformity to whatever the precepts are. I saw it in religious conversations, you know, around 2011, 2014. This is something that I was very into having these religious conversations and try to challenge religion where I found it. But what you would see is that you you would see religious people, they would not let certain ideas be challenged. They would not discuss them or the particulars of them. They just said, no, these are established and we're not talking about those. And you certainly see that now. So when it came to evolution, when you had a discussion about evolution with somebody who rejected it, who was religious, the way that it would go was that they would say that, okay, if there's any complexity in the world, If there's any space for complexity, then that equals that I can make a ridiculous claim. So if there's any complexity, like, you don't understand how the the first multicellular organism originated on Earth. You don't have all those figured out yet. So therefore, I can make a ridiculous claim like the invisible superperson that I know was the one who created everything. 
And quite obviously, all religious people don't follow these lines. It's just that that's the kind of conversation that you could have with a particular kind of religious person who rejected evolution. So you have something similar now, where if you can, uh, if they can ascribe any kind of complexity to the idea of gender, so, uh, you know, things like people who are born intersex, or what is it, Klinefelter's disease, or whatever, ones where you have multiple chromosomes, then that equals, they can make absolute ridiculous claims, such as there's no meaningful distinction between men and women biologically. Not only that, but they ascribe metaphysical importance to the precepts. So the analog here is that uh, when trans people say you're denying my existence, that's what they say is the result of you arguing against whatever they're arguing related to trans ideology. That that is the equivalent of saying you are jeopardizing my eternal soul in religious precepts. It's not verifiable in any way, but it raises the stakes to infinity in an effort to win the argument. The gravest problem right now is that it's a religion that has governmental power. And it's not just restricted to the ones that we've talked about so far. There are things like uh, that they use, like climate activism. Notice when they talk about climate activism, it's invoked in a religious way. It's not a matter of, okay, here are the things that we need to do. This is how much it's going to help that will solve the climate problem, so therefore we'll, we won't have to do these things anymore. They don't talk in those terms. It's never specific. It never cares about whether China or other countries get on board. It's always just a blanket, you have to agree to this, you have to do the things, engage in the religious activities that we state, listen to our clergy, and that's, that's it. That's the only role that you have in this process. Same with racism. It's not that there's some, there is a, an identifiable instance that we can all have a look at and determine whether that's racist and then, you know, come down on one side or the other and have it resolved that way. It's that either there's someone somewhere espousing a racist view or having a racist thought, therefore racism exists and has to be tackled in some kind of broad way. Or even if that weren't the case, if everybody, <laughs> literally everybody was non-racist, then we have to look at the systems of oppression that specifically contribute to racism in some vague way but there's nothing identifiable even if we had equity you know everybody earned the exact same amount then we'd have to we'd say that some races have to work harder to get to that place than other races do and of course just in our they call the united states currently they call it a horrible racist nation even though people of color are overrepresented in many ivy league schools overrepresented in boardrooms and on tv and there are multiple people of color categories that do better by every metric societally than white people and still we get this idea of uh, the systemic oppression uh, based on racism. And then uh, in addition to those, there's things like hate speech, which is really, I don't like that speech. It can often be demonstrably true, but it's still considered hate speech. I mean, everybody knows how broad that category is. But the whole point is that as long as there is sin, people need more Christianity. As long as there is imperfection, people need more progressivism. It's structured along the same lines. But so, to summarize, uh, everything weak is demanded to be re regarded as strong. That's the transvaluation of values that's occurring right now. Christianity had guardrails that were worked out over centuries. It had moral precepts descended from on high that were just general good moral precepts. It had tempering factors like the Protestant work ethic, the enlightenment that had just come before, and the American dream. And you weren't the center. This is really important. You weren't the center of all this stuff. God was. Progressivism, on the other hand, has none of those things. There is no internal moderating principle. There's no moral guardrail. It's pure tribalism because it came on the heels of the rejection of the other religion. And you are the center when it comes to progressivism. Progressivism is a cult of selfishness that desperately wants to be generous with the resources, wealth, and status of others. So, to <laughs> tie it back in with the book, it's definitely a good thing to see somebody who is advocating for the kinds of ethical precepts and ideas that come out of the West that are specifically in contravention to the kinds of things that they're trying to do now. That's why it's a transvaluation of values. They're trying to flip all the values on their head and say that, no, these are the values now because it benefits them personally. So we have to keep fighting this, obviously. Uh, this book, I would recommend that people have a read of this. And we're going to have more books coming up. I think this is only the first one out of the five <laughs> that we had to finish. But I'm getting in deep to a couple of other ones. I think at least halfway through one. And a good chunk of the way through the other. And almost done with another one. So we'll definitely get all those done and get those posted. And we're going to have some other stuff coming up. But otherwise, I hope you're having a good summer. It's been good for me, apart from my horrible, disfiguring injury. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's been good. Otherwise, I hope to see you on the next one. All right, bye.